All right, Proverbs chapter 14, we got through verse 5 last week, and so we'll start with verse 6. Proverbs 14 and verse 6. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. A scorner seeketh wisdom. We'll take, take the first phrase first. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. And we're, we're going to cover that first and explain that. Let's pray first. Let me get my head together here and ask for the Lord's blessing to help me to keep my mind on, on what's important here tonight. Father, I pray that you'd bless us and help me as I teach. You know, my mind is full of a lot of things. And, uh, and I need to be able to focus. And so I pray that you'd help me as I teach tonight from the book of Proverbs these very important principles. And may wisdom be gained uh, in the minds and hearts of those who... By faith, look to you and ask for wisdom. Give understanding, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. This first clause shows that it is the actual scornful attitude that causes a person to not find wisdom. That's the problem. It doesn't say a person seeketh wisdom and findeth not. It's because they are a scorner. That's why they don't find it. Now, here's the interesting thing. You say... You say, I know some scorners that are pretty wise people. Well, it depends on what kind of wisdom you're talking about. But a, scornf a scornful attitude means you're full of scorn, which means you don't respect something or somebody you ought to respect. And a scornful person is usually someone who doesn't respect God. So that's why you see, if you, if you ever debate like this, this lady that engaged this guy that, that, uh, on, on this YouTube channel, you know, I mean... They went back and forth for quite a while on the screen. You could scroll down quite a while to see their, their dialogue. And what she ran into was a scorner. She didn't know that. She was innocent. She went, so, oh, uh, you just say that because you're, you're, you're this, is, this is, I see this happen a lot of times to people right before they get saved. Oh, boy, he came on her and attacked her. I'm not about to get saved, whatever. You know, he didn't use that word, but he, he let her know, no, I have, I'm not interested at all, you know. And um, so, um, and so she tried this. She kept trying to be nice. And, uh, um, and he's just trampling all over her. So, uh, so she's probably shocked by that. But that's because she probably doesn't understand a scorner when you see it. And so, uh, so you, that's why you've got to be careful. The Bible says, for example, in another place, which we'll cover eventually, uh, answer not a fool according to his folly, uh, lest you be like him or something like that. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly lest to be wise in his own deceits. Now, so which do you do? Well, which, do you want, which risk do you want to take? <laughs> That's what it is. God, God tells you, answer a fool according to his folly, and here's what's going to happen. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, and here's what's going to happen. So somebody needs to answer a fool to, according to his folly, but some people ought not, because they don't have the ability to handle what will come later when you do answer a fool according to his folly. And that's what that verse, those two verses teach. So it's not a command to, to do one or the other. It's God telling you, you know, do this, and here's what will happen. Don't do this because, you know, this, this will happen. And it would be wise not to. But it doesn't mean it's, okay, for example, it's not wise to, to take on a fight that you cannot win. Yeah. You know, um, if you want to survive. Now, some things are worth fighting and losing over. Because, especially like, uh, I love this one kid that my pastor told about uh, in high school or college, after, I think it's high school. He was a little squirt, and there's a big guy on campus thought he was it, and, and the big guy picked on the little guy. And, uh, oh, he's a new kid to, 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 to school. And uh, so the big guy is trying to, you know, let him know I'm the, I'm the big dog here on campus. And, and, uh, and, and that little guy got whooped. And uh, so the big, the big guy, the big bully, you know, I thought, well, that's one more guy who knows who, not to mess with me. But the next day, that little, that little kid went up to him and, and said, I don't like the way you treated me yesterday. And the guy looked at him and said, man, you don't learn very fast, do you? He says, I'm not here to learn. I'm here to stand for my rights. And I don't like bullies. Oh, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to knock your teeth out if I can. And the bully says, what if I knock yours out first? Well... I'll be seeing you tomorrow, too, because I'm going to fight you until I whoop you. <laughs> so they got in a fight. He lost again. Next day, same thing happened. And that guy got better, and he got better. Finally, who whooped the big guy? 
And that's, that's the thing, you know, that's what you got to, so, you know, some people are not that way. Not everybody can, is, is willing to fight and then lose and have to fight again and lose, have to fight again. Some people are not that determined. Some people, okay, all right, you win. All right, you can have what you want. See? So everything is not, every, everything commanded in the Bible is not for everybody, you know, uh, it, uh, using that as an example. So a scorner, you got you to gotta be careful about what you do, how you deal with a scorner. And I know it really doesn't have much to do with it except the subject of scorners. And if we were taking the subject of scorner and I, I would teach you all about scorners, then you'd, that'd be worthwhile. But, but it's still worthwhile to mention it. So a scorner, the, the problem, the reason a scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not is because he is a scorner. That is the problem. See? So uh, it, it prohibits the entrance of wisdom. A scornful act. Attitude prohibits people from seeing things that otherwise would see. Why? They've got a closed mind. They're a critical mind. All right? Now, so, but he doesn't know that. See, it doesn't say the scorner seeketh the wisdom, findeth not, and is frustrated. It doesn't say that. He doesn't know he hasn't found it. See, they think they're pretty smart. They think they're pretty clever. See, but they haven't found wisdom. I'll show what they found. What they found is what he gets is worldly wisdom, not true wisdom. There's a worldly wisdom. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are very street wise, but not wise. Yeah. That helps you understand, right? Okay, now, let me prove it from the Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Let me give you some context. Let's start with verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They're not saved. They don't understand why. What's the big deal about believing some guy who hung on a, supposedly hung on a tree years ago? That's the way they would word it. But there's no supposedly about it. But anyway, um, so it's foolishness to them. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God flows from the fact that God loves us enough to, that he came to pay a debt he, that we did not, we could not pay, that we owed. And, uh, and only God could pay it because only God's infinite. And he could pay an infinite penalty. So, the power, all the power of God comes from that. Power to, power to be born again. Power to have your sins forgiven. Power to be able to get into heaven. And power to have your sins forgiven after you've trusted in Christ as Savior. And get all cleaned up. And, and power to overcome temptation. I mean, all the power in the Christian life comes from the preaching of the cross. See, that's why I preach about the cross and about salvation, explain it just about every message. At least I, I, I refer to it uh, so often because that's the source of our power. All right, now, verse 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? In other words, the person of this world who disputes with what God says. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? See, so there is a wisdom that comes from God, and then there's a, world's, a wisdom of this world, which God counts as foolishness. All right, verse, um, let's, keep, let's keep on going. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. That is because they rejected the wisdom of God. They didn't have the wisdom of God to understand God, therefore they rejected him. All right, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks were always, they were known for having their little cliques and their little clubs and their discussions. You had the esoterics, you had the, um, uh, you had all kinds of groups. Even in the church, you had the Nicolaitans, and you had, you had all kinds of groups of people that were, you know, studying the, uh, you know, you, you had the Platoists, you had the Socrates, uh, the, the, the Socratic society, and all, all that stuff, you know. But that's wisdom of the world. And people, and I see all the time, people quoting in the liberty movement, talking about, you know, Socrates and, and some of the people from that time of life, the Roman and Greek empires and, and so forth. And though that, wasn't worldly, that, that was worldly wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. And that kind of godly, that kind of wisdom, worldly wisdom, is not going to get back our liberties because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not where there's some philosopher. All right, now, so 
verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, watch this, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, therefore, skip down to verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the wise of this world. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty in this world. And base things of the world and things which are despised, God hath chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Okay? So, why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. See? The world, scorners glory in their quick wit. And, you know, I'm smart. Don't mess with me. I'll... I'll riddle you with uh, verbal holes, I should, I guess. I don't know. Holds with words. Now, okay, now let's go to uh, chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 and verse 6. Let's start with verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice the contrast. See, there is wisdom, but there's two kinds of wisdom. Worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. There's wisdom of men, and there's wisdom that comes from God. Verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. And by the way, it says we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. It means those that are, that are that, that, it's talking about the saved there, those who've been made perfect or made complete. Their, their record in heaven is perfect. Uh, there's no sins uh, listed there uh, because they've trusted Christ as Savior. But So we speak wisdom unto them, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So the wisdom of this world, here's something we can learn, the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the princes of this world will come to nothing. Not means nothing. N-O-U-G-H-T means nothing. So, um, uh, let's see. All right, let's go to uh, chapter 3. We got 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 2, and now chapter 3 and verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh a wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men. Why? God deserves all the glory. He is the source. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's got wisdom that can't even be compared to the wisdom of this world. So, so the scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, because all he gets is worldly wisdom, which is foolishness of God, which is not really wisdom. But men call it wisdom. So, but God says clearly here, he seeketh wisdom, but findeth it not. All right, now the next phrase, uh, or the next clause, or the second clause of verse 6 of Proverbs 14 says, But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. See? Knowledge is easy to him that understandeth. That's because when you have understanding, knowledge comes easily. It is also retained easier. You get knowledge and you remember knowledge uh, much easier um, uh, if you have understanding. Now, wh what does that mean? All right, let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 130. I love this verse. I'm glad my mom made me memorize this. All right, Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Such an important principle. So when you let the word of God have entrance into your heart and mind, what are you going to get? You're going to get light. People talk about the Illuminati, the illumined ones. Well, guess who they're illumined by? Not by God. At least not the God of the Bible. They're illumined by the God of this world, Satan, whose name is Lucifer, means light bearer, but it's a much, definitely a lesser light than God. See, um, in fact, you might you might say there's a, there's an interesting uh, parallel between the Bible talks about the 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 sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night. We're children of the day because we're born again through faith in Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh. People who believe the devil's lie. They join, they, they get in other religions. And, uh, and so, what's the, what's the 
what's the largest as far as, um, well, anyway, you know, what a major religion today is that has a god that actually is a moon god. You know who that is, don't you? Muslims. Allah is a moon god. That's what he is. <laughs> He's a lesser light. Why? It's Satan. <laughs> He's just a light. He's not the light. He's the light bearer. But he's corrupted by his brightness. He's got brightness. Otherwise, God would have called him Lucifer. But he's corrupted his wisdom. So therefore, the wisdom that comes from him is wisdom of this world. And, and uh, oh man, now I wish I'd written down this other reference. I, I didn't want to get there. But, but there's a place where the Bible says that the princes of this world knew what Jesus was doing. They would not have crucified him. See? Satan's got wisdom. Oh boy, just like, remember the parable of what Jesus told uh, about the man who, who has a vineyard and led it out to some husbandmen and he sent his servants to, to uh, re bring, bring back the, the fruits that have been reaped by the husbandmen and they said, oh, let's, and so they beat one servant and killed another. Why did they, they didn't want the husbandmen to get, to get his, what's due him. They want to keep it to themselves, see. And so, uh, so anyway, but at one point he says, I will send my son. They will reverence my son. But they said, here's the son. He's the heir. Let us kill him, and then the vineyard will be ours. And so Jesus tells that parable to illustrate what's going on in this world. That Satan thinks, because he's so smart, he thinks he can whip God. But his wisdom is corrupted. He cannot see that he's going to lose. The, the day, even, even though the Bible says so and tells all about it, he thinks he can outsmart God somehow. Because that's the way scorners are. Scorners don't, they seek wisdom and they think they got it, but they haven't found it. Because they have scornful attitude. It's like Satan, he got scornful of God, getting all the glory. He said, I will ascend into the, uh, I, I will be like the Most High. I will sit in the side. He wanted to be in God's place. And so, uh, yeah, he's, he's the moon, he's the lesser light, uh, God's the real light, so, so we need to serve the God, uh, fear the Son who has healing in his wings. Okay, so um, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the what? What's the last word? Simple, okay. <laughs> see, now you need to memorize it, see? Okay. So it giveth understanding unto the simple. So you see, the wisdom of this world is not hard. The wisdom of God is not hard to get. The thing that it prohibits it is a scornful attitude. So change, when a person changes their attitude and respects God and respects people and, and ceases to be a scorner, then wisdom is easy because it's easy for him that hath understanding. And the entrance of thy words, not the memorization, the entrance. A person can come to church and just hear the word of God. They don't have a scornful attitude, but they, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. They don't have to know everything. But the entrance of his words is going to give understanding. It's going to give light. And they're going to understand something they didn't understand before. They won't understand everything, but they'll understand what they need right then. And they keep on going, they'll get something else. Why? Because it's the entrance of his words. But the words can't even enter the mind and heart of a scorner. They've got, a, they've got a wall out there. That's why arguing, debating with a scornful, critical person is a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Now, it doesn't mean you should never say anything. Put something out there, but just don't debate them. It's not worth the time to debate unless, okay, here's it. Okay, in other words, it's a waste of time as far as you thinking you're going to get them saved. But it's not a waste of time if other people are watching and listening. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's why uh, there, there are some sites. I go on there and, and I'll, I'll engage somebody, but not because, in fact, I told them, look, I'm not re this is not response for you. You're not going to believe this. And I have no hope of you ever believing this. I, I really, I, I'll, I'm blunt sometimes. He says, but I know other people are going to read this, and this is for them. <laughs> See? So, so I don't mind debating a scorner, but not for the scorner's sake. I'm doing it for other people who will see and hear. You know, the Bible says, a smite the scorner, and a simple will beware. See? So I may rip into a scorner and, 
you know, verbally rip his head off and show what an idiot he is. But I'm not trying to hurt him. I'm trying to make other people, wow. <laughs> Boy, he sure tore that guy up. And they're going to respect and realize, you know, um, okay, I don't want to talk about myself or any details, but, but I, this is stuff, this is the kind of stuff I do on a regular basis on the internet. I engage atheists, I engage critics, but I do it not for them. Um, you know, I don't spend time because I'm trying to win them over. I'm trying to win over other people who will see. See? So, all right. So the scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understands because God wants people to believe him. And people who scorn him, he knows they're not going to believe him. They scorn him. But anybody who doesn't scorn him, God says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some light. So, so the main thing, the one, that's why it's so important uh, for parents to, one of the most important is to develop proper attitudes in your children. It's the attitude that determines whether God's word does any good or not. See? If a, per, a person could come to church, you know, a visitor could walk in, well, I'm going to check out this church. I hear, I've heard some things about it, Ruben. I want to just see. It. He can come here with a critical attitude and get nothing. But if a guy comes in here, life broken, less messed up, and nobody's answered his question, he's frustrated, but he's still looking for truth, and there's got to be somewhere I'm going to try this church, because he's, he doesn't come critical, he just, he's coming like, one more chance, I'm giving a church one more chance. He's not coming critical, he's coming desperate. <laughs> there's a difference, see. And as long as a critical spirit is not there, he has an opportunity to be reached. See, so it's real important when you deal with people, and learn and read their attitudes. And if it's just you and them, leave a witness and then don't try any longer. You'd be wasting your time. It'll only take the Holy Spirit, and and actually, I don't. The Holy Spirit's not going to waste time on them either. Now, what God can do, God has another arsenal. He can break that person, cause them to. Life can happen so much that they, they're broken from their, you know, you know, you know, a person can be a rebel until they break a leg, oh, and then they need, uh, they need the town sissy to lean on. Oh, man, give me the doctor. You know, and then he's feeling bad that how he treated the sissy or, you know, the, the, the nerd or whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. So a guy who, a guy who criticizes somebody else, and he, I don't need you and all that, and all of a sudden he breaks a leg, yeah, he needs the weakest guy in town can be a help to him then that guy might be open. You see what I'm saying? So, but that's something that God has to deal through circumstances of life. All right, I hope that gives you a little bit of wisdom about, about uh, that verse, verse 6. Um, all right, let's go to verse 7. I like this verse. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. This is really good. I, yeah. Let me read it again. Go from the presence of a foolish man. Foolish man. Notice, don't hang around a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Notice, this is a man who's talking. He likes to run his mouth, but it's not based on the word of God. It's not, this is knowledge. It's not based on the word of God. When someone's like that, God says, what's the point in hanging around him? Go from his presence. He didn't have the lips of knowledge. You're not going to get anything good. There's nothing good. So, um, I learned this. I learned this lesson. I made a decision. I had a, I had a particular friend or roommate or doormate or somebody in, in college. When I was in Bible college. Who, I became convinced that he didn't speak knowledge. All he wanted to talk about was his experiences. What he thinks, well, I heard this, and I, I felt this, and I, here's what I feel about this. I don't care what you feel about something. Other than pain, I care about that. But I mean, I don't care what you feel about this doctrine, that, and what does the Bible say, see? So when you hear people, well, I, I feel that, you know, God's not going to be, God's a loving God. He's not going to send anybody to hell. That's all based on feeling. It's not based on knowledge, see? 
So when people start talking about God based on their feelings, rather than what the Bible says, the Bible says, go from them. Don't waste time. Because without knowledge, they can get their, you know, that's where, where you get the, these uh, bleeding heart Republicans and Democrats. Well, we just feel like we need to do such, what, how, what does the Constitution say? You know, what does the Bible say? What are the principles? What is, what is, what is constitutional law? Not what is one, some statute or ordinance. Some, you know, all laws are not good. <laughs> That's why laws get repealed. Because just because something is in a law book doesn't mean it's right. But what is right is law. It's natural law. It's common law. It's, it's divine law. But man's law is not always right. So we need to learn to apply these biblical principles and, and if there's no knowledge, if it's not based on the Word of God, don't waste time. And especially if it's a person, go from their presence. When you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. That doesn't mean if they make one mistake, they say, I feel, instead of the Bible says one time, when most of the time they say, they quote the Bible, or they, uh, it's not, God's not looking for excuses when to leave a church. <laughs> because one time, one incident. Yes, when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Not because he said something, but he didn't have the lips of knowledge. Notice, never does he re refer to this as his authority. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Let's move on to verse 8. I want to see if I can get a little further tonight. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. This also is a good one. Let's take that first section first. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. All right, so let me read a statement, and then we'll give you a verse. Anyone can understand someone else's way, right? You can always see someone else's faults. Easy when you see your own, all right? So, but the wisdom of the prudent is to, is to understand his way. So what does it mean by the prudent? Well, let me, let me give you a verse. Uh, turn to Proverbs, well, same chapter. We'll just... We'll just take a peek further into the chapter, verse 15. Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. So, a prudent man is the kind of man who looks ahead. It's like the Bible says, um, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple passeth on and is punished. So a prudent man is someone who's always watching where he's at and what's around him. The New Testament word would be for that, would be for, to describe a prudent man, would be someone who walks circumspectly. Circumspectly comes from the word speck, the root word speck, and then the, the, the word circum, which means circle. That means that around. You, you look around you. A prudent man looks around. He looks well to his going. He foreseeth the evil. He sees something developing, and he moves over here. The simple, he's like, he's in his own little world. He doesn't even notice it, and he goes right into a trap, and he gets punished for not having the wisdom. So, so with, that, with that understanding, it, this makes sense. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way because he's circumspect. He looks at the way he's going. He analyzes. He, let's see, is this a good way for me to do it? No, it's, it's according to the Bible. Maybe not. No, I, th I think I'm going to change my way. And now he has a new way based on the Word of God. And he looketh well to his goings to make sure they line up with the Word of God. And therefore, he doesn't go into traps. He doesn't get fooled uh, by some new trend or some new doctrine or every window doctrine that, that the devil throws out to try to lure people away and waste people's time. He doesn't fall for all that stuff. Because he looketh well to his way. He, that's the wisdom of the prudent, to understand his way. So, anyone can understand someone else's way and false, but only a prudent man can understand his own way, along with his own faults. A prudent man is the kind of man who will see the mote in his own eye, or the beam in his own eye. Now, it may take a while, because um, we none of us sit around and say, oh, let's see, let me ponder the path of my feet. We don't do that every day. We should. The Bible says, ponder the path of thy feet, let all thy ways be established. So you have ways of living. And if you want to solve a problem in your life, you know, I, I keep having this problem. It keeps repeating. Okay, then you better study your ways, the way you live. Ponder. Ponder means, it's, it's almost kind of like pound. It comes from the word pound, I believe. It means 
It's like when you get a map. It's all crumpled up, you know, wrinkled up or folded up. You unfold it, and it's got all those ripples and from the folds, and you just, you, you, you do this. You, you just, <laughs> now that I want to do it, I can't. Okay. That's what it means. So you can look and study and see where you are, where you need to go. Ponder the path of thy feet, that all thy ways be established. That's what a prudent man does. He looks at the well to his goings. He gets out the map, looks at where he's at, finds where he's at, finds where he needs to go, how he needs to get there. And finds, and he, and, uh, to, to use today's analogy, you uh, call the highway department, find out if there's construction going on before you make a trip that's to where time is important. Find out if, what's the best way to go. Is there construction here? Is there going to be a backlog? Are they, is there like a 30-minute wait while they let traffic come this way? And then, you know, you, you find out all that stuff. You look well to your goings. You ponder the path of your feet. And so uh, prudent men will do that. They'll ponder the path of the feet. Oh, I'll give you a perfect illustration of this. I've been frustrated at keeping track of some of my files. So today when Mary came to help, uh, help me with that, I told her, she said, I'm frustrated. Help me f how I can come up with a better system of keeping track of where I keep stuff. Isn't that what, what we did? You know what I was doing? I was pondering the path of my feet the other day, and I realized there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. See? So that's just an example of it. Uh, example of prudence. And you need to do that with your own life. If you find the same problems keep coming up, well, you need to stop. Maybe call somebody, a friend, whom you can trust and who, thinks you, who you think might have some knowledge about it and say, look, I w I'm not happy with my way, the way things are going. I want to find a new way. I want to find a biblical way or best way or whatever it is. You know, filing systems aren't mentioned in the Bible, so I'm not going to, you know. So, but, so, so I asked somebody that I thought might have some good sense because they do things, some things faster than I do. Anyway, now, so take time to think about what it is, what things in, about the way you live that keep giving you problems. Why do you keep having the same repetitious problems? Okay, then you need to ponder the way you respond, the way you handle, the way you do things related to that. So if you keep having people problems, well, maybe you need to check out how and why you respond to people the way you do. Is it their actions? Is it their words? Is it their looks? Is it what you expect? Is it because you think you, no one should ever um, debate you and disagree with you? I mean, find out what it is. Ponder the path of thy feet. Let all the ways be established. So that's the wisdom of the prudent. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. <laughs> the folly of fools, what makes them foolish is that they are, they're, they've been deceived. Somewhere along the line, they think their way of doing things is good when it's not. They won't even consider changing. They've been deceived. So um, the, only, the only solution is Get some wisdom. All right. Verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Now, the first one's kind of, kind of obvious, but fools make a mock at sin. As they have fun with it, they, they mock, and, they, oh, hey, uh, you know, hail, hail, the gang's all here. Let's eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow we die. Okay? They, 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 and, and they laugh, and, and they see who can outdo somebody else. Hey, let's see. That's why you have drinking parties, and you have... Uh, what's that st stuff they do with that pipe that, that uh, yeah, they suck that pipe that starts with a B? I forget what. Huh? Bong, yeah. What's bong? Uh, this is where you get a big lotus. I don't know. I don't understand much about it. But y you, get, y you just get a bunch of smoke in a, a whole bunch at one time. I don't know. I, I'm not the one to explain all that. But, 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 but in the world, they, they make a mock at sin and they, they exaggerate and they go further. They push the envelope. Why? Because they. Do not respect sin and its punishment and its consequences. If you don't respect something, you mock it. Yep. See, it's like as a kid, there's a wino in our neighborhood. We didn't have any respect for him, so we would mock him. Hey, what you doing today? What time is it? What's today's date? We'd ask him questions that we knew if he's drunk, he wouldn't know. Well, oh, it don't matter, you know. 
hey, you want to play basketball? We'd throw the basketball at him. And he, he was slow to react, so it hit him in the chest every time. <laughs> and we thought it was funny. But what were we right then? We were fools. We were foolish children because we did not respect a man who is a victim of who knows what. We didn't bother to find out. Why are you drinking? Maybe he lost his wife. Maybe he lost a loved one, and he didn't know how to handle it. He wasn't saved. He didn't have the Lord to lean on. It doesn't give, uh, it gives no one a right, oh, you're not saved, you don't know how to handle it, so we're going to give you a hard time. That's foolish. I hate to tell that story, because I hate the memory, but we were foolish kids. Didn't have wisdom. So fools make a mock at sin. They don't respect it and, and its consequences. But among the righteous, there is favor. I'll spend more time on this. I like this. Among the righteous, there is favor. All right? And by the way, I wasn't saved at that time. I got saved when I was 11. We used to tease that guy when I was 8, 9 years old. All right? Um, with the righteous, or among the righteous, there is favor. Among doesn't mean, you know, you know, somewhere here's three righteous people standing and somewhere in between them is, no. It means among them. That means in them. Uh, it's in their midst because it's in them. Um, there is favor. All right, let me give you a couple of references real quick that we used not too long ago. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord, see, and also with men. So among the righteous, there is favor. Why? Because if you're, if you're righteous, it's because you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, and, you, and all your sins have been blotted out, and the righteousness of Christ, righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you, and therefore God calls you righteous. He, he sees your faith in Him, and He counts your faith as righteous. That's what makes us righteous. Not because we do everything right, but because we've done the one thing right to do, and that is to honor the God who loved you and gave Himself for you and paid for your sins, and when we do that, God counts your faith as righteousness and you become righteous in His sight because He caused you to be born. A new creature is born of God that cannot, will not, never will sin. And therefore, God calls you righteous, not your flesh righteous, but that new you that was created the day you trusted Him, his, him as Savior. So among the righteous, there is favor. God is certainly going to favor a person who's never going to sin, Right? I mean, you're, you're righteous. Your, your spirit will never sin. So God's going to favor that. See? So, uh, so among the righteous, there is favor. All right? And, you know, a good cross reference to that is Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Where it talks about Jesus himself. There's another good verse to memorize. Luke 2, 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and stature, no in there. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with who? God and men. And that's, that's a good verse to, 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 I won't take time about that, but in, in my Bible studies I do with like a, with a new person saved and, and who wants to start Bible studies, I always use this verse at some point to teach them to learn as you grow, you will grow in favor, not only with God, but with men as well, because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the side effects, or the, uh, what do you call it, the side benefits, anyway, um, of when you serve God and live for God and try to please God, God will put you in favor with men. See, It's like Joseph uh, had the favor of Potiphar, even though he was, he was sold into slavery, Potiphar put him in charge of all his stuff. <laughs> And then uh, when his wife was imp so impressed by Joseph, she, was, uh, she tried to seduce him day after day, and he refused because he was honorable and wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't give in. And, uh, and so she, she felt spited or whatever, and so she, she, tried, she tried to force him. And then he left, ran, and, but she grabbed his coat, and he just he got out of his coat and kept on going, and she was stuck with his coat. She was so angry and so jilted and so humiliated by that because she knows that he now could tell her husband what she tried to do. So she turned the tables on him. She said, I got his coat. I can, oh. She called all the servants, help, help, help. And, said, and then made a false charge that he had tried to attack her. And uh, so Joseph got thrown into prison by Potiphar. 
but see, Joseph hadn't done anything wrong, and he, he was in favor with God. So guess what? It wasn't long before he was in favor with the warden of the, uh, of the, the prison. And he put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. It wasn't long before uh, a baker and a uh, butler from the king that got put in prison sought his advice and told, hey, we have, we have a dream, but we, we don't know what it means. And Joseph said, I'll tell you what the dream means. He prayed and God revealed what the dream means and he, he explained what the dreams meant to both of them and, and both dreams came true. And the one guy that got back, Joseph said, hey, when you get back to being the, the king's uh, but, butler um, uh, or baker, whichever, I forget which one was which, but anyway, he said, when you get back to tell the king about me, I've been here on false charges. And, but the guy forgot. But over time, the king had a dream. God gave the guy a reminder. <laughs> he gave the king a dream. The king couldn't un understand the dream. And then the butler said, Oh, you know, I had someone tell me what my dream meant in prison. And it came to pass. And the baker he used to have, the same thing. And, and whom you killed because the dream meant, told he was going to be killed. I'd be restored. So both dreams came true. You ought to go ask him. His name is Daniel. Or not Daniel. <laughs> Joseph. Uh, but anyway, so uh, two, two guys in the Bible had interpreted dreams. I got mixed up. But anyway, so you see what I'm saying? Joseph increased in favor with God, and therefore everywhere he went, no matter even if he's in prison, with men too. So uh, among the righteous, there is favor. So live, walk in the Spirit, walk with God, and you'll get in favor with your boss. You'll get in favor with your neighbor. You'll get in favor with more people, even strangers on the street. Uh, the more you walk with God, the more there's going to be something about you that's going to change. And it's going to change your character. You're just going to ooze trust. See? So I was at a Home Depot not oh, a couple years ago. And a lady was talking. She needed a sheet of plywood because some thieves broke into her house. And, uh, and so she needed to board up some windows. And, but she didn't have a way to haul the, haul the plywood. And the store was about to close. It was late at night. I was coming back from a, some kind of a liberty meeting or something, a patriot group meeting, and, and stopped there to get some, to get some small thing. And, uh, but I happened to have my truck, and so I overheard her talking to the guy. So I thought, you know, here's a lady by herself. Her husband's not home, and uh, she needs help. She's already been broken into it. So I said, oh, ma'am, you know, here's, I know you don't know me. I'm a pastor. So... Um, I'll be glad to take your plywood, haul it on, tuck my truck, and just follow you home. And so she says, oh, that'd be great. So she did. She trusted me. We got there, and uh, she showed me the window, and I said, wow, boy, that's going to be tough to fix. You're going to you're gonna have to do this and this and this. She says, yeah, well, I'll rub us through the garage. I got my husband's tools somewhere. I'll figure out some way to do it. I said, well, man, if you'll let me, I'll be glad to do it. I can do it much faster. I can be, have it done in a few minutes. She said, would you? Now, why would she let someone do all that and get access to her home and to her garage, her husband's tools, unless she had some trust? Mm -hmm. See, so when you, when you live a certain way, there's just going to be, you know, may, may, it could be just because I said, said pastor, but I think if I hadn't even said I was a pastor, I think she would have trusted me. But anyway, um, so among the righteous, there is favor. And by the way, if there's favor then when you need a favor, think it's going to be hard to come by? Probably not. So there's, there's a benefit. So, so don't mock sin. Mock sin. Fear God. Keep His commandments. Do the best you can. When you fail, confess your sins and then believe God's forgiven you and go on in that joy and resist temptation and fight, 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 fight. Fear God. All right? Let us stop there. Father, I pray that you bless the Bible study to our hearts and, and help us to apply our hearts unto wisdom. And uh, may some of the things that we learned tonight really help us. And may our wisdom increase. And uh, may we increase in wisdom and knowledge and favor and with God and men. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.